I'm Al Phil Reese, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening three friends to collaborate on a close but not too close reading of a poem or two. We'll talk, maybe even disagree a bit, and perhaps open up the verse to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for some poems that interest us some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because Poem Talk poems are available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Penn Sound Archive writing.upenn.edu slash pen sound. Well, Poem Talk has gone on the road again, and we are here in Los Angeles, California, at the Pacific Palisades home of Marjorie Perloff, who for the third time, I think it's the third time, in Poem Talk history, has generously agreed to host us, along with audio maestro Chris Martin and videographer, editor, director Zach Cardner, who are recording this episode for both audio and video playback. I'm also joined by Robert Von Hallberg, professor of literature, Claremont McKenna College, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and author of many books, among them, Lyric Powers, The Maltese Falcon, To Body of Lies, Spies, Noirs, and Trust, American Poetry and Culture, 1945, 1980. Last time we did this, Bob, I said this was a very important book for me, and it remains so, and Charles Olson, the Scholar's Art, among other work, and by Charles Altieri, Professor Emeritus at Berkeley, also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he too, author of too many books to name, including Wallace Stevens and the Demands of Modernity, The Art of Modern American Poetry, The Particulars of Rapture and Aesthetic, Aesthetics of the Affects, Canons and Consequences, and one new one, which I have a feeling is going to be part of our Gathering Paradise at the end, so we'll hold off for that. And by our aforementioned kind host, the amazing, super productive Marjorie Perloff, Austrian-born poetry scholar and critic whose books include, just to name a few of them, Edge of Irony, Modernism in the Shadow of the Habsburg Empire, Unoriginal Genius, The Vienna Paradox, a memoir which has now been translated into five languages, I want to say, possibly, maybe six, Wittgenstein's Ladder, a book that is back in everybody's minds, the futurist moment, and relevant to today's poem talk, her 1977 book on Frank O'Hara titled Poet Among Painters. And who, just to add some fun facts, okay, we've never done this in an intro, but we're about to, took her graduate degrees from, you don't tell us, anyone guess, graduate degrees from? Uh, Catholic University. Catholic University, bing, yeah. you get a point. <laughs> um, whose second teaching job was at... The first was Maryland, or the second. I think Maryland counts as the second, because you, yeah. yeah, okay. Maryland is the answer, so you get a half point for that. <laughs> um, who left Vienna in when, what month and year? Oh, you can, the Anschluss, <laughs> March of 1938, whose very first book in 1970 was about? Oh. Yeats. Yates, oh. yeah. you win, you win, <laughs> and <laughs> we've never done this before. Oh, there's one more, and whose most recent book publication is a new translation oh, of the private notebooks of yeah. Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1914, 1916. How was that? We've never done a bio no. quiz. Marjorie, no. thank you. Hello. Thank you for hosting Hello. us again. Hello we've, to you, Al. We've Great had to some, see you. We've had some fun conversations yeah. in this spot. Bob, good to see you as always. Nice to see you too. Thank Al. you. And Charlie, you're a rookie on Poem Talk. I can't yes. believe it. No, well, yes, we did a little small thing at the. At we the did Huntington. at the Huntington right before COVID. That I said, let's. We pulled out our phone. And we did the same of a Stevens. We both talked Stevens. I think we did Anecdote of the Jar. Yeah, yeah you I, did it. Yeah. Or we out at the Huntington. I think so. I'm not sure. Did we do sn the Snowman? No. no. We did Anecdote of the Jar. We did Plot Against the okay. Giant. That's right. That's right. Okay. Such fun. Anyway, yeah. welcome, Charlie. To, well, today the four of, he, four of us have gathered here to talk about two poems by Frank O'Hara. The first is titled Poem, or Poem, Lana Turner Has Collapsed, very famous. Um, and Song, Is It Dirty, sometimes known as Song. They are both obviously printed in the collected poems of Frank O'Hara. The recording of Poem we'll hear is from a reading O'Hara gave at the Lockwood Memorial Library at SUNY Buffalo in September of 1964. And the audio of song we'll hear is taken from the TV program USA Today Poetry, 
sorry, USA colon poetry from the 11th episode of that series produced by Richard Moore for, w, for KQED TV and WNET in New York and was extracted from the video originally filmed in New York at O'Hara's apartment uh, in March of 1966. So here now is Frank O'Hara performing poem, Lana Turner Has Collapsed, and song, Is It Dirty? The next poem is called Poem 2. <laughs> Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard so it was really snowing and raining and I was in such a hurry to meet you but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky and suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. The next poem is called Song. Is it dirty? Does it look dirty? That's what you think of in the city. Does it just seem dirty? That's what you think of in the city. You don't refuse to breathe, do you? Someone comes along with a very bad character. He seems attractive. Is he really? Yes, very. He's attractive as his character is bad. Is it? Yes. That's what you think of in the city. Run your finger along your no moss mind. That's not a thought, that's soot. And you take a lot of dirt off someone. Is the character less bad? No. It improves constantly. You don't refuse to breathe, do you? Let's turn to the Lana Turner poem. Bob, start with you and everybody can follow. I'm interested in the use of the verb tenses. I naively, every time I go back to O'Hara, I think, Oh, he uses the present tense. I do this, I do that. It's amazing. But then when I reread this, I realized it's a very complicated use of tense. It's not so simple. Can you get us started? Well, uh, it, it's the um, it, it's it's in the present at the be, at the beginning has collapsed. We're in the moment where that's a report on the past, uh, but we're in that moment. Although he doesn't read it dramatically, that first line at all. Yeah, but then going. Then it goes into the past with I was trotting along and so forth. Um, and it uh, it breaks out at, um, and suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. And uh, there, into, into the present. And I think what's interesting, I mean, what I like about the poem, aside from its being amusing, is that it's, encouraging it's a little it's a little moral parable of come on get up and let's get him get him move on so with the past then shifting into the present and extracting the lesson of the past into the present at the end of the poem so Marjorie it seems to what Bob is suggesting is it seems to work with the I do this I do that with the setup of the there's a little playfulness about the past does that make sense to you? Yeah, and I think it's very accurate, too. I think one of the important things about O'Hara, we were talking about this at a, at a discussion about, of all things, Robert Lowell and Frank O'Hara, because he wrote it on the Staten Island Ferry. You know, at least he said so. On his way to a reading. On his way to a reading at, at Staten Wagner Island. College. And he And he wrote it, and um, Robert Lowell got very angry and said, well, I'm gonna, I don't read poems that I've written on the ferry, you know, I right. not, don't do that. So it was sort of uh, suspect in a way. And obviously it was sort of also poking fun, I think, at Whitman's Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, Hart Cranes the Bridge, all those things about bridges and ferries. But the word collapsed is very interesting because you can collapse from all kinds of things. I mean, you can collapse from illness, you can collapse from other things, but the accuracy is that Lana Turner was no longer in 62 what she had been, the wonderful sweater girl and everything of, um, 
of The Postman Always Rings Twice because she had had all that trouble with Johnny Stompanato, her husband, and the daughter, Cheryl, whatever her name was, Crane, had knifed him. You remember that? The daughter was, they had had a huge fight, and the daughter got so upset that she knifed him. Or took responsibility for Turner took, and knifing him. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah, right. And so Lana Turner was in the news a lot, but for all kinds of things and not such good things. And so Lana Turner has collapsed. I mean, it's such a famous name. It's still a famous name. Witness Calvin Bedian's magazine, Lana Turner. You know, it's the ultimate movie name in a way, and yet collapsed. So, I mean, the choice is, it's not just any movie star, I want to begin mm -hmm. by saying. Yeah. Um, Charlie, I want to turn to you, but I want to throw a monkey wrench into the verb tense thing. It's, it's a problem I've had, or not a problem, it's a query I've had about this poem. Lana Turner has collapsed, so as Bob said, it's kind of an ongoing thing. It could be present, could also be, we would use that as a way of saying it happened recently, but in the past. Then I was trotting, which is another way of saying the setup of the story is I had been trotting before the present, but I was trotting, that's okay. That is to say, I'm moving along toward the present. And then it started raining and snowing and you said, so now we have a you, we'll talk about that. You said, so, Either someone is accompanying the speaker to the occasion, and that would not be you say, it's you say. It could be you say, but because the weather is always present in O'Hara, but it's you said. How, so you would be someone with him at the time, or it might be some other person who typically says, but that's a past tense, you said, and how would that person he's imagining elsewhere say of the present where it's hailing, not quite hailing. It's not, I'm, I'm I don't confused. see anything confusing about the tenses here. That's because He you're sees so a headline. Lana Turner has collapsed. You're walking along, so it's yeah. in perfect tense. But you said, I was walking who was along. saying it when? I, no, I was walking along. I and was you, trotting along. Trotting is a very strange word. People don't trot. Yeah, animals trot. Yeah. I was trotting along, and suddenly it started raining. So this is going on. This is the yeah, ongoing but, thing. The rain. Who and said then when? you said, who well, said it's when? obviously it's somebody it's, else. When it, it could Bob be, understands my dilemma. I think it, it could. He could have been someone who who said yes yesterday after on that afternoon it was hailing. They could so have another later time. said that another time. Yeah. yeah. So there's the there's the past tense, yeah. which just threw me yeah. off, probably in a trivia way. Charlie, take us and, anywhere you want to go. Well, I, I mean, I, I think just in, in terms of tense, it emerges in the present as I see a headline, right? So all right. of that, which is a strategy of a right, that it, he it, uses. It, 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 it gets incorporated into the past, but it's also the present, and you gets incorporated in the, in the we, which I love actually. Uh, How does that and, happen? Uh, well, just we love you, get up. Uh, so you yeah. and I, the speaker O'Hara and some friend or lover or pal, join the we to say we like you, Lana. Okay, got it. But, but, I that's mean, good. That, that's, what, that's good. What interests me most about the poem is just what is the uh, worldview in, in which this speaking occurs and what's the attitude towards Lana Turner? Um, and I think that... He sets it up as uh, a contest, right? Uh, who can collapse and who can't collapse? Mm -hmm. uh, who, who can push the limit further? Uh, and uh, because she can push the limit further, he wants her, they, they love her, uh, get up. And I, I see, I think it's, it's partially I, my own account of gayness, which is, it, it becomes a kind of, in that New York environment, it becomes a kind of freedom from... Uh, enlightenment, moralism, uh, senses of rightness. And it, it, it allows a kind of cultivation of intensities and presence um, so that the poem is, in a way, a kind of celebration of non uh, of morality. Of disgraceful. Right, right, right. Uh, but, uh, to a point but, is your point. Well, uh, as a contest, <laughs> right? how, how, how much can you risk or how much can you... Uh, reject moral standards for love for uh, uh, other kinds of uh, relationships. And when, when I was preparing, I, you know, um, it's as if Nietzsche gets invented in a kind of minor social tone, but the rejection of mainstream 
um, moral thinking seems to me virtually absolute in this poem. And, 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 and so it, it, that's how I see that, that this, this conflict between, not conflict, but contest between how O'Hara can be uh, beyond the pale and what happens when Turner tops it, right? And, I and have been watching the expressions of our two friends, and I cannot wait to hear <laughs> first Bob, then Marjorie. What, what are you thinking? Uh, I want to go back to, I want to follow up, I think I'm following up on what Charlie said on, uh, about the uh, suspension of moral judgment, and, but go back to Marjorie on the word collapse and focus on that. Because I think, I think it's, um, it's obviously a complicated word, but uh, when he says, oh, Lana Turner has collapsed, and then it's as though somebody somebody said, "What's she got to to worry about? What has what's Lana Turner got to? What justification for collapsing does she have?" That line's excised. There is no snow in Hollywood, and now we get the the artful recovery of the of the relevance of what seemed irrelevant before. That is, was it hail or was it rain? And and that's that's recovered here. Like the environment is perfect in California. What has she got? What what reason does she have to collapse? You know, and she has some reasons. We were just discussing. Them, yes, right? that's that's right. And uh, and then uh, and so. The, the, the atmosphere, the weather's perfect. Uh, I've gone to I've gone to parties and behaved perfectly disgracefully, but I never did that. I never never, never collapsed. collapsed. Uh, and then the solution to Lana being collapsed is, we love you. Come on, the get we. Up. That's a yeah. crucial part of it. Yes, yes. We we we. It whatever, forms a community. You know, whatever virtually. your problems are, right. they 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 should be resolved by feeling loved. And we love you. Get, come on, get up. Marjorie, what are you thinking? Well, I don't think, I think it's just a very ordinary situation. I think one reason people love Frank O'Hara all around the world is we've all had this experience. I don't see so much the higher mor the morality in it, namely, I'm feeling rotten. I've got a hangover. Last night I behaved perfectly disgraceful, been to lots of parties. But so I'm feeling pretty awful and it's raining and hailing and I'm late and New York is horrible and there's noise. And you see this headline, Lana Turner has collapsed, which is such a ridiculous headline. Is there mm -hmm. no other better mm -hmm. news that you see mm -hmm. on the newsstands as you walk yeah. by? But who the hell cares? Lana yeah. Turner. Oh, well, Lana Turner has collapsed. There's no rain in Hollywood. I mean, I, she didn't even have a reason to collapse like me. Who knows why he collapsed? You know, whatever. But I've never actually collapsed. And oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. And I don't think it's so much about love. I think it's the joke, the kind of campy joke about you know, thank you for having collapsed because you give me permission. I feel better about last night. I feel better about the rain and the hail. It's not so bad. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. You know, so it's that's also, how I read you, it. You focus on the word trotting. I'm trotting. trotting. And you, you're just you're lying there. Right? <laughs> right. And you, I've I never acted. Never. I've been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, and it's hailing and raining. But you say it's not hail because hail is different. I mean, it's just that awful moment we've all had where you're walking, you're miserable, and he sees something and it makes him feel better. I've done all those things, but I've never actually collapsed. So, well, feel, why do you say it that, that that having done all those things doesn't mean he did it last night? Right. I mean, it, there's nothing in the he poem says to so. suggest I've that. I've been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful. You would presume it's the night before. No, why do you but presume I never that? Actually I, don't pres past. I don't presume well, that all right, at all. But, all right, but let's say I, you don't. But so then you that, don't. That, that contextualizes the love. I mean, because you, you can love Lana Turner as a kind of um, aid or support, or you can love Lana Turner because she breaks the rules. Oh, right. you can not love her. I would say he doesn't. I don't think he's saying he loves her. I'm saying, oh, thanks for saying that, Charlie. I love you. I've always felt that way, you know. Oh, I, I mean, it's that kind of love you. I, I, I you think know. that trivializes the, the poem. I, I want to, <laughs> before we turn to the other poem, I want to throw something out. It's probably a little goofy, but that's my job. Um, uh, we, he famously wrote it on the Staten Island Ferry. He's on his way to Wagner College. I even know who the host of the reading was. It was Willard Moss who was uh, Marie Menken's partner and a uh, bisexual filmmaker and very much in the scene. And he, he was on his way quickly to this, to this reading. There have been several accounts of it. I love the phrase, get up, because 
it suggests a certain productivity. Lana Turner's a has-been. She's not getting up. Uh, O'Hara's got to write another poem for the reading tonight. I mean, you almost get a sense that he's run out of, and he does it right there. That is the best getting up I've ever heard. Getting up is like, I'm going to write the poem right now on, and screw Lowell, who thinks I had to have spent <laughs> six months in drafts that are all now at the Harvard Library, <laughs> the, the Lowell thing. Really a different mode entirely. I'm, I'm going to write it, and I am going, I'm getting up. It's a, not survival. It's... It's standing up. It is productivity. It is, I can do this. This is what I do. Exactly. Come on, Lana, yeah. you can do That's it too. too. How does that sound? I agree. And, and yeah. I agree too. And in the context of poetry, <laughs> I mean, was, the con think of Lowell's Lord Wary's Castle, you know, uh, how dark that was and how mm -hmm. awful, I mean, years before, granted, you know, yeah, 15 years. years before, long time. Yeah, before. 15 years. So, but the, um, uh, but but this is very affirmative, and that's the beauty the beauty yes. of Frank yes. O'Hara. You know, is that yes. he has he has that bright spirit. Speaking of acting disgraceful, I love that non uh, adverb there. Yeah, acting disgraceful. I wish I we could should talk, talk that about way. that. <laughs> yeah, do you want to talk about that before we go to the next poem? Um, yeah, I think I think I do. It I mean, signifies. because it's hard. I, I listened to you, and you hesitated a little. Marjorie in almost couldn't it. say almost it. Almost right? couldn't say. Couldn't say it wrong. You could almost you not the adverb. You had to add the adverb because that's. Yeah. So, so what does that what does that tell us about the artifice of his style? Yeah. That is, he's. Who is it? Does he not know that he needs an ad adverb there? Clearly, no. he knows. No. So, but but why? Then he's pretending to be somebody who, who is occupying a zone of the English language that doesn't discriminate who, between adjectives and adverbs. And who's also moving very fast and is not going to revise, yeah. supposedly. Ah, okay. You know, yes, I like that. Good point. But speaking Good point. of per acting perfectly disgraceful, um, we have another <laughs> poem where you know, there's this seedy side of. A city. I guess my opening question is for Charlie. Um, it, in the first line, is it dirty? At that point, we don't know what it is. We're going to learn what it is, I think. But at that point, it, is it dirty? I mean, I, because the, song, because the poem is called Song, my first reaction when I first read this poem is, oh, it's a dirty song. It's dirty. Yeah. That may be in later, but clearly something else is dirty. Charlie, Nominations are open for what is dirty. A shirt. A shirt? Yeah. He's getting dressed, thinking about what to, about. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. Marjorie doesn't agree. I just think it's the question, is it dirty? Is the subway dirty? Is the city dirty? It means like are the weather. It, it's not supposed to be it's one It's dirty thing. outside. Yeah. What is dirty? Is it dirty? But of course, also, is it dirty? You know, is the song dirty or whatever? Charlie, yeah. by doing my poem talk thing and saying it is open-ended, you know, is it open-ended? It is, isn't it, a little bit? Um, well, I mean, it's open-ended in the sense that it, it doesn't have a referent, uh, but it, the open-endedness produces part of the tightness uh, of, of the poem because the, 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 by, the, by the end, right, both it and dirty have changed. Um, I mean, it, it becomes this possibility of this encounter, uh, and dirty becomes a blessing, right, at least as I... Uh, as, as I see it, and dirty becomes a blessing. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it produces the promise of a sexual encounter that um, cleanliness. Where is would, there the promise of a sexual encounter? Um, With the guy, well, someone who, comes along. The guy who's who's. Well, he up. he has a crush on somebody, yeah. Yeah. and he's told he's very bad, but he has a crush on him anyway. That doesn't mean they're having an encounter. All right. Well, that, no, something that's of an encounter. The fantasy that's what's encounter, at stake. At least. That, that, a that fantasy is, encounter. That's should what you, you think of should you city. go to bed with this guy? At the very least. Yeah, but it's not clear that that's even available. No, but it's desirable. <laughs> yeah. It's desirable. It's desirable. Oh, yeah, but that's different from having an encounter. Okay. Um, it, but anyway, it, the referent moves and the dirty moves. Those are my Can we points. riff on I, what dirty means in, in a lot of different senses? I mean, there are two, obviously, that we're already talking about. But let's spell it out for folks who want to hear us spell it well, out. Well, I think it's a shirt. In the beginning, because I think he's, he's getting, getting ready, ready. and think he, think, he thinks no. <laughs> he asks, "Is it, you know, what you do? You check out the shirt. Can you wear this shirt again? Uh, is it dirty? Does it look dirty?" And then he says, "That's what you think of in the city appearances." Mm. 
you know. You, I think you're specifying it much. Is it dirty? Does it look dirty? That's what you think of in the city. That is what you think of in the city. Why would it be a shirt? So you well, I mean, you know, it could be a jacket. It, that no, doesn't matter. why is it an it at all? Because it's, it's well, dirty. Well, because he's going, he's going out dirty? into the city. Is the house dirty? Is the garden dirty? Is it dirty? But now I see something that I hadn't before. I should have, maybe. You don't refuse to breathe, do you, means, even if it's dirty. Exactly. Right? I didn't see that. But it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And, but we have a lot of complex things about the city going on. First of all, breathing the dirty air, right? And breathing this was as at an time, analogy yeah. to being dirty. Right? This is a dirty, grimy time. So I, I'm still at, you guys are all too sophisticated for me. I just want to riff on what dirty could mean. Well, in, in, in the sense that dirty no more is mine. It's a city adjective. It's the New York adjective. Right. The thing that was always said about New York, especially in those years. It's oh, dirty. it's so dirty. We're I can't moving live to there. Westchester. It's too dirty. New York is too dirty. Right. I don't want to go to New York. But so it begins with a normal question, a silly question. Is it dirty? But it quickly becomes obviously something else, which is it is the thought dirty. Is the, is the thought dirty. dirty, acting disgraceful? But where, where I, I don't he has understand. Dirty thoughts. I think that's a phrase I heard when I was a kid. You, you can't have dirt. Don't have dirty thoughts. Dirty thoughts. Or yes. joke. Yes, yes. Is it a dirty joke? A dirty, is it dirty joke. joke. Yeah. yeah. That, that. So that would be when your finger along your no no moss mine. That's not a thought. That's that soot. I mean that's. Yeah. Um, no moss mine. What a phrase for this poem. Yeah. Uh, the heck it's quite is that striking. doing there? Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? I don't know. Not don't countryside. You don't. Way, you the don't. Best I can do. You don't. Uh, your mind doesn't stand still. No moss grows. No oh, that's moss better. growing. That's on, right. Yeah. I yeah, think right. when I think no of that phrase, yeah. well, yeah. I think of that phrase uh, that I must have been a kid when I heard somebody say it for the first time. I say it all the time. No moss growing on that Rolling Stone, meaning. Frank is so kinetic and so active. There's no moss growing on him. But the run that your made... finger also suggests masturbation. And dirtiness. White, no the moss white glove mind. treatment. You, you can know. do a lot with it, but it's sexual. I think that's a sexual. Well, a that's not a thought. That's so, <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Someone comes and, and, along. And that's also, again, that, that's embraceable, right? I mean, that's yeah. the... And you take a lot of dirt off someone. Dirty... It's such a wonderful word because it means so many things. Physically dirty, dirty idea, dirty thought. But it's but dirty desire. I, I think, think that that's the what... re the reason his poetry works so well is it begins with something anybody might say. Is it dirty? Mm -hmm. Does and it the look question dirty? arises: Can you clean someone up, and are they still? You know, you right. clean up nice. That's a serious There's another question. one of those <laughs> adverbs. You clean up nice, but Not you're still person, a dirty yeah. character. Yes, but then, but then he says, um, he he qualifies that uh, by saying, uh, "Is the character, is the character less bad? No, it improves constantly." Yeah, so what does that mean? It's it, a, I think it means funny. that uh, he, that w cleansing this person in any one in one any one stroke not possible. He's still right. going to be that person. However, mm -hmm. the char the character uh, improves. In time, because that is what, like, I mean, I take it the question is whether you go to bed with this guy and 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 f fulfill your uh, your desire. You, you, you feel the desire. You know this guy's... Despite is, character flaw. Yeah. And Not just is, character flaw. is he <laughs> going to improve by, uh, by it? No. Not going to be able to remove that. But in time, uh, it improves. I want us to talk about New York. I think I'm, it's a very important topic. I agree, in, especially in the second poem, but probably in both. Who wants to start, Bob? Well, I think here, I think this is a kind of Baudelarian poem uh, in the, the one we're talking about, about the the um, the dirtiness of the city, the sootiness of the city, and the and the and the lowness of one's desire and coming and the need to, which Baudelaire certainly feels to. Not only to become one of the low, uh, I don't know what, uh, you know, the, the, the underside, not only, but, but he admires, and there's a poem, uh, Le Jeu of, of the Game, and the, in, a, in a bordello, and, the, and he's, he's describing these very ancient prostitutes and gamblers and pimps and so forth, and admiring that they, that, that they have been persistent in their desire. And 
he, I think what he is doing here is questioning. It's hard, I may be wrong because it makes him seem prim, but it, it, I think he's questioning the nature of his desire for this character and that, that it's, the, it's a desire of slumming, sort of, you know, that, and th this is an urbane right. desire to want to sleep with this guy. Where, did, where does that come from, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, you suck it in with the air, you know? And this is where we, this is, it, this is something he has to accept, as Baudelaire has to accept, uh, uh, that it's inside him. fascinating. Margie, do you want to pick up New York and then Well, Charlie? I think the tone is very different from that. I just don't see the, I mean, I love Baudelaire, but I don't think that's the tone. I think it's very light, and I think it's something that, I would say that is iterative. It happens all the time. You know, we're talking. I'm talking to Vincent, and I say, "Oh, you know, man, and, you know," and he'll say, "Oh, you don't want to get involved with him." You know, he's got a very right. bad character, and the very fact that he has a bad character I, makes him more appealing. I think I, oh, really? He comes along. Is his character bad? Is it? Yes. That's what you think of in the city. Run your finger along your no moss mind. That's not a thought. It's soot, which is such an amazing line. As if. You're having a, na a, a thought about something dirty, so the thought is soot. Mm, yeah. It literally mm -hmm, is. It mm -hmm. yes. becomes soot. As you, and, and you take a lot of dirt off someone. Is the character less bad? Yeah. No, it improves constantly. You don't refuse to breathe, do you? It's sort of the, the willingness to say, I'm not prudish. I'm not going to be impressed by this. He appeals to me, whoever it is. And it may be somebody they met last night or last week or you don't know. He's not there. It's not anybody who's right there, I don't think. There's no indication of that. And so, you know, the two people talking, the usual conversation, do you want to meet so-and-so? Well, he's a pretty bad character. And the more he, that said, the more it appeals to him, in a way, you know. Charlie, I, I, can I, mean, I, I agree with Marjorie's reading, but not the tone of her, of her uh, reading. I, I mean, I think this is too general, but if you imagine that song is connected to pastoral in a way, this is the kind of perfect urban anti-pastoral. Uh, and the, uh, the, the celebration of the reversals all the way through become a condition of Im not just living in the city, that that's what Lowell would think, but embracing the city uh, because it's not the country. It's not moss. It, uh... It's no moss. <laughs> yeah. No moss. But it's also yeah. dear, dirty Dublin. You know, I think of that. Yeah. I mean, good. it's that kind of dirty. It's you know, all dear, over. dirty Dublin. You know. Yeah. Could could there be Likes a better the dirty. way of describing O'Hara's approach than what you just described? I think I'm with Marjorie on tone, but I still want, and maybe it's just the poetry critic or poetry teacher in me that wants to make things like big, but the breathing to me becomes, I don't, I don't want to say serious, because it is, you know, oh, you don't refuse to breathe, do you? Ha ha, that's smart. But there's something about breathing, its relation to poetry itself, inspiration. Well, how about living? You don't refuse to live, do you? No, but it is breathing. It is breathing specifically because, of course, it's got that fabulous. taking it into your body. Yeah, it's an aspiration and inspiration. But, you know, I want to take the poem seriously as a poem about poetry, and the only way I can do that. Yeah, why you don't do you want, want to, to take it Because seriously. that's my job. Well, why why, <laughs> why, 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 why it can't seriously. it be about the city and about I think desire. it is about why the city. Does it have to be, I think it's about, about the poetry. city in relation to poetry. Why is that your job? I mean, the whole, the whole purpose <laughs> is to see how you can maintain I like, that light tone. I like and the, you couldn't maintain it if you overwrite it. The typical poet would overwrite this poem this way. I met so-and-so and, you know, seemed very... I and love then this I was part. warned about him. And then there'd be a lot of detail about who he was, what yeah. had he done, who else had he had an affair with, right. and all that. And you don't have any of that. You don't know. That's the whole purpose. You don't really I know who it is. I think... You're describing Cavafy. What? <laughs> Cavafy. Well, but he's got wonderful uh, poems about this, about desiring yeah. working class men. You don't know, and, they're, and it's they're not even like grind. Elliot with lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. You don't. Does the other person really have a bad character? Maybe X is just saying that, so you'll Maybe stick it's with him. Just gossip. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Vincent is okay, saying that to Frank. A, this is a, for me an existential question about me. That is to say. Um, when I find a metapoetic moment, and I do believe the breathing, it can be that, or is that, or I want it to be that, one of those three, uh, I want to take it seriously. I know it's, you don't refuse to breathe, do you? Ha ha, that's really clever. But 
You don't refuse to breathe any more than you refuse to be in the city, any more than you refuse to act out your desires when you can. And I think that poetry is associated with those desires and with needing to be in this particular place, this dirty city. I, I think that I think it's a pretty serious. Do you topic know that he's ever going to act out his desire? You don't know. I think that. he's happier well, yeah. with the song. How do you know? No, I I don't know. I'm no. saying he's happier having written the song. I think it's the same thing with Lana Turner. I think he's really delighted that he put together a poem that quickly that is every bit as sophisticated and complicated in its rhetoric that we have discussed. How marvelous that he was able to do that. All of that. Yes. I mean, this is as I don't know if we said the word worked. But this is as worked as for the Union Dead, which took the guy eight months to write. It's remarkable. Yeah, no, we, we, but I think that the, the, the middle stanza is the metapoetic, more, more forcefully metapoetic than, 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 than the Can breathing. Can you say why? How? Because it turns you mean what someone comes is along? a description into a kind of uh, validation of a mode of desire. So it just changes the, the, the affective conditions of uh, what the oppositions are, like dirt and, and, uh, and, and non-dirt, because it puts, it puts a human context on it. Um, and and, and the, the placement of that is, it seems to me just absolutely brilliant. I would like to go twice around. Uh, once around to invite each of us to say something about both poems, if you can, either comparatively similar or somewhat different. And then the second time around for final thoughts, any kind of thought you have that you haven't said yet. Bob, are you ready to do either of those? Yeah, I think okay. so. I, uh, I love the Lana Turner poem, have always loved it, and I love the lightness of it. And I love Kavafi. Uh, and I think O'Hara and I think of O'Hara and Kavafi as being a good, a good kind of pairing for, clear, for making clear both of them. I don't love this. This this is a dirty poem. You don't. I don't uh, because I. It, it's so moralizing, and uh, I don't understand the position from which you'd begin. And maybe this is just my limitation. Uh, I don't understand how you'd say, I'm really attracted to X, but he has a bad character. Should I or shouldn't I? Um, I think I think that that such a person, how can such a person have the lightness of spirit and the sophistication to write the Lana Turner poem? Is the way I'm putting it. Mm, That's, interesting comparison. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Marjorie, a thought about both poems together, uh, or about O'Hara in general? Yeah, maybe. See, I think they are very, as, as Alice pointed out a minute ago, they are very constructed. They seem very casual, but they're very much constructed. Everything, if we look closely at the line breaks, very, he's attractive. But where I disagree here, and I, I do like this poem so much, is I don't think it is about the real thing. I think it's what we tell ourselves. Like, you tell me, you might want to meet so-and-so, you know, and then I say, oh, what's he like? And you say, well, you know, I have a bad character. I mean, it's about that basic, I think all these poems are about basic moods, mental processes, whereby we justify ourselves or we try to explain why we did something. That doesn't mean it's a good thing to do, and it doesn't mean that's how you meet people and so on. But when you're, when you're confronted with, with this kind of situation where maybe it's somebody you really shouldn't meet, you justify it by saying, you don't refuse to breathe, do you? I mean, it's a way of justifying oneself. And, a lot, and so is the Lana Turner poem in a different way, a way of justifying yourself. And they're meant to be, I think they're generalized enough so that there isn't too much specificity, so that anybody could have this feeling. And I just think that's very appealing and very hard to do, and it's very funny, as I say, that that's not a thought, that's soot. Of course, it is a thought, he's thinking it, but it's a dirty thought, so it's yeah. soot. That's, it's very, dirty. that's charming, that it's moment charming. in the poem is charming. Uh, but I'm, what do you think about the word character? That is to say, which he himself? No, the he uses the, like he's oh, the assessing a sexual partner 
in terms of a prospective sexual partner, in terms of character. I don't I'm think no it's that literal. I mean, he's saying, you want to meet so-and-so? Well, he's really got a bad character. I mean... Well, I, no one's ever said that to me, I don't think. What? I hope not. Yeah. But it, oh, I wish I would say it's that. I've had that said to me it's many times. Word. It's a, Are you no, kidding? That's my I've had that use. said to me mm -hmm. often. Well, they're kind of, you know, he's really not a good person and makes yeah. you more attractive, really, in many ways. Charlie, your turn to talk about the poems in comparison. Well, I mean, I think that the, as people were saying, that the lightness is crucial, but the lightness has a finality to it. You can't imagine another word to an O'Hara poem. I mean, you know, and, and that's really part of the, the striking uh, effect. And of course, he doesn't do it with images. Uh, he does it with sheer intelligence, almost, you know, that, 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 that sense of finality, which is really remarkable. And Lana Turner is a great example of that. Um, the, the other poem is, is not, uh, but I, I, I increasingly like it because it, 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 it makes all the figures operate, right? I mean, the dirt, the ordinariness in the beginning, the sense of that middle stanza and how the person is introduced and how, how one context of dirt just shifts entirely to a, a, a different kind of context of dirt and, 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 and evaluation. Um, and again, I mean, there's nothing else to be said. You breathe, don't you? I mean, that's, uh, and that, that natural, that, that's, we, you know, I mean, Olsen could say that in a way, right? Uh, but Olsen would want to mystify the breathing process. Whereas uh, O'Hara's point is it's totally natural. Uh, and, and I think that's part of the, of the power of the, the poem. Uh, Marjorie, you're yeah. the host, so you get to break ranks and say I one more say, thing. I just say one other thing. I think it's much more literary. So is Lana Turner than we're acknowledging. And that's one of the reasons O'Hara is so different from many of his imitators, you know, many of the New York imitators. Now, literary, for instance, this is the theme of, let's say, Lotte Lena Sorabaya, Johnny, while I'm business. Do, look how bad he is. He's a bad guy. And the more he's bad, the more I want to sleep it. So, you know, and so there are many. It's a common theme. And he certainly knew a lot of the, he certainly knew the Three Penny Opera because yeah. he has a poem on it. And it's a basic Three Penny Opera theme, especially because he's a bad guy, has a bad reputation. That's why I'm drawn to him. Otherwise, it might be very dull. And so, so. In both poems, I think in Leonard Turner, too, we could look and find, we haven't, but there are lots of literary references to earlier poems. As I say, the one about um, um, trotting and so forth is also just, you know, the morning walk. I mean, there's so many poems. Or the way we said crossing Brooklyn Ferry. You know, I mean, he, he's very literary, Frank O'Hara, much more than he admits. And so there are a lot of literary cross-references. And that might make you feel a little bit differently about the word character. Yeah. I don't yes. take it so, you know, it's just like, I mean, I always, when I listen to that song, I think it's so peculiar. You know the song I mean, right? The Lotte Lania song I mean? No, I don't. No? Will you sing it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, one talk. Uh, Surabaya, Johnny. Warum li? Why do I love you so? Du bist kein. Du bist kein. You have to ask kein Herz. You have no heart, Johnny. But that I love you so, and it nimm doch die Pfeife aus dem Mund. Take your pipe out of your mouth, you dog, you know. And then how she falls for him, and then how he treats her, and at the end she's still singing Surabaya Johnny, and is still that attraction. So it's about, it's a, I mean, if you want a larger theme, it's about being attracted to something you know isn't good for you. Mm -hmm. It could be anything. And I keep wanting to ask, does poetry have anything to do with that? Poetry itself. What do you mean? Well, this stance of, gosh, I'm, I like to do things that are probably not good for me, or I like to get involved with people who are probably not good for me. No. Does poetry, does his but writing. But once you state that, you lose the poetry. Right? Yeah, oh, well, so, I wasn't no, the one who said it. Well, I don't know what you mean. Marjorie is referring to an important tradition that enables the stories, the scene, and then that enables the tone and so forth. It's, it's partly a... How about Clarissa Lovelace? Well, exactly. I know he's not good for me. Yeah, but you, exactly. You know. So this is a, this is a time-honored tradition, and it may be quasi-pose for, uh, for O'Hara at certain points, but what does that have to do with the production of the poems? I think everything. I think this is, that's the get-up point I was making. I think what comes out of this thought about Lana Turner, what comes out of this 
oh, saw out saying. of this experience is that he got a really good poem in that tradition, and he did it perfectly using the speaker who's not quite O'Hara, because O'Hara, I, ho I hope he took, you know, was more, a little more careful in this. But you hope he as, a, as a biography, this is not the biographical O'Hara that we think it is. That's part of the charm of it, we think it is. But he's really good at making poems out of this stuff. Let's go around <laughs> one more time. This is a final thought on our discussion. It could be anything, a final thought. This is not our recommendations. That's next. Quick thought. Something you came today to want to say, but you didn't have a chance to. Um, well, from the discussion, I'm struck by, uh, uh, I th I'm thinking differently about, about O'Hara. Oh, really? From Great. having the discussion, because I, I think all the, the artfulness of, and the intricacy that's come out in the conversation, um, I don't think, I haven't been thinking of O'Hara that way. I think of, I, I do, and what Charlie was talking about, about the closure of, of the poems, uh, and especially what, uh, the closing of the is a dirty one, um, that's kind of controversial for me because I think he's got a lot of his art invested in clever remarks. Yes. And uh, I'm not sure that I've got as much desire and admiration to give to clever remarks as, um, as one might if one's really a, an O'Hara uh, fan. I'm not, not that I'm not a fan, I like, I like particular poems, but mm -hmm. I don't really, mm -hmm. I don't really think that I can explain why it is I love poetry in terms of clever remarks. Thank you, Bob. Well, Marjorie, you know, I, I, you know, when I first wrote my horror books in the seventies, and where people said, "Well, he's not really a major poet," and the funny thing is, he is. If you just look at look up, you know, sales, that wouldn't necessarily mean anything. But he's one of the most popular poets in the world, in Poland. You name the country, and I'm trying to think why that's really so. And I think what you could just call clever remarks is an incredible way of creating tone. Now, he doesn't always achieve it. There are plenty of poems in the collected poems that drag or that don't quite work or whatever. But I think in both these and in many of his poems, what he's able to do that almost no other poet I can think of can do that way is um, a balanced tone so that the tonal register is so well done, the address and the sense and the way you feel you're overhearing and coming in in the middle of it, and that it's so funny that he can laugh at himself. I think I was made in the image of, this, of a sissy truck driver. That's in Naphtha, one of my favorite poems. I think I was made in the image of a sissy truck driver. I mean, Auden didn't do that kind of thing, you know, sort of couldn't do it. And I don't think Ashbery, I'll say something outrageous. No, I won't say it. I won't say it. <laughs> All right, I will say it in a way. To me, O'Hara died when he was 40, but I think he's an even, in some ways, to me, better poet than Ashbery. As the years go on now, I feel that Ashbery was overrated in his time. I mean, there's no other poet that everybody from the, you know, Harold Bloom to that everybody praises Ashbery. And Ashbery, there was a lot of this kind of tone too, but often not quite as well done and somewhat self-indulgent. And um, O'Hara really isn't self-indulgent. It's, 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 to me, great because it captures the way we all feel in a way, and that's why people like to recite it. And you can be a completely different person from him and still feel he he captures that quality of wanting something, desiring something, probably not being able to get it, but it's just that mood. And I don't think they're clever lines at all. I hate clever lines in poetry. The I mean, I think there's so driver? many poets that have these clever, well, where are the clever lines? That, he sissy just, he truck just, driver. That's a, that's a clever line. Well, but it fits note. into the poem. You see, in the context, it's only a matter of context. There's nothing wasted here. I mean, I'm not saying this is one of his best poems. I don't even think Lana Turner is one of his best poems. But when he says, grace to be born and live as variously as possible, Second Avenue, it has grace. I would say the quality that O'Hara most has to me is a, a grace, like a ballet dancer almost, on toe. You know, he's 
when he's on. He's not always on by any means. The collected poems is thick, thick, and a lot could be eliminated. But but the grace is very special and very sad. I want to get back to something Charlie said before. I don't think, you know, a lot of people, Jim Breslin wrote on this and other people have written on this now much more, that in fact, he's not such a cheerful poet. It's very sad because these moments don't last. They never last. And there's always death around the corner. And there are many poems that do deal with that directly and that obsession with death. And then, in fact, he did die so young. And so there's a lot of sadness and a lot of feeling you never get what you want, really quite. And you joke about it. Charlie, final thought? I, I had a very um, interesting to me experience because I've always seen O'Hara as a kind of... Um, ally in sort of personal responsiveness to the, to the world. Um, but partially because of what I'm thinking about, I think now that there really is a challenge to philosophical thought in this work. And it's essentially, this is a kind of naturalism What's entailed in that naturalism? How do we come to terms with the sadnesses? How do we come to terms with the limitations of desire? And it's really trying to work towards a totally secular culture. Um, I think that's a good and, 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 and a sense that um, even the whole intellectual processes are not close enough to the domains of desire and immediacy to help sort of work out the kinds of values we, we, we need. Uh, so I, I, now I think that, that there's really a kind of instructive quality uh, in, this, in this poetry that I hadn't seen before. Appreciate uh, that. So f my final thought is not as big and grand as what, I mean, what you guys have said is amazing. I just want to say something fairly narrow. Years ago, a student came to me and said, I want to get going on my writing, not pre-writing, state of mind thing. That's, I don't know how to, I'm not a creative writing teacher. I don't know how to do that. But how do I get in the first lines, how do I get a sense of revving up? How do I get going to my topic? And I asked the student to read this poem. And then later I went, and you know, it was apparently helpful. And later I went back and I tried to figure out what was my intuition about that. And it's the ING words which are at the beginning, which disappear, he doesn't use any ING words after he gets going doesn't need to. It's almost as if, I don't know, it's a motor scooter and he's like vroom, 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 vroom. So trotting, raining, snowing, hailing, hailing, snowing, raining. That's all in the first few lines. And then he doesn't need the, that thing, that powerful way of setting a tense. And it is just brilliant the way that works. It's almost to the point of too much, you know, if you were the Create a writing teacher with a red pen, you'd probably say too many of these ing words. But then he just goes off and does his thing. So uh, we like to end poem talk with a minute or two of gathering paradise, which is a chance for all of us, if you're quick, to spread wide our narrow Dickinsonian hands to gather something really poetically good to hail or something going on in the poetry world or the film world or the op world. And so who wants to gather some paradise? Bob, do you have any recommendations? I have something on my mind. That is, um, I've been, I've been thinking with with my student. I've been teaching a poetry course to undergraduates who have, you know, walked into the room without any real interest in poetry, and trying to get them to appreciate chewy language, condensed language, language that is not very familiar from current speech and trying to see that to appreciate the obvious artfulness of phrasing and so forth when it's not trying to be natural whereas we've been talking about the most famous poet in english for being natural and being uh at home in speech and uh i've been reading rereading uh kleinsoller and uh and he has a, his most recent book is Snow Approaching on the Hudson. And sometimes it's hard with clients. So I think, well, what's this poem about? Is it about an experience? But a lot of them are just gatherings of strange terms and strange voices. And he's very non-O'Hara, though they're both city poets. Mm. Uh, they both feel the, 
feel that what they should be doing is, you know, is, is uh, recording and rendering memorable, unusual urban, urban experiences. So I would recommend his, his uh, Snow Approaching on the Hudson, a different kind of poetry. When was it published? Uh, 21. 21, so it's yeah. new. Yeah. Thank you. Good yeah. suggestion. Marjorie Perloff, recommend something. I'm going to recommend Charlie's. <laughs> Charlie <laughs> really, himself, Literature, right here. Education, and Society, Can you Bridging show the, the Gap. Camera? Because I haven't read it. I mean, I've just gotten it. But Charlie really, of all people I know, really has a great understanding for uh, education without being corny about it and doing the usual sociological moves. I've just been reading John Guillory, which I, in a way, am disappointed in. So I'm hoping that uh, I'm looking forward to reading this and bridging the gap. And um, I'm very glad he's taken this on because, you know, we can all say things, but it's so hard to take this topic on today when English is studies are in so much trouble. Um, the other book I'm going to recommend, which we were talking about before, is Afro-Pessimism and Incognito by Frank Walderson. These are mixes of autobiography, um, theory, doctrine. Um, the narrative part is much the best part. The, the theory is sometimes overdone in some ways. But the narrative part is simply brilliant because, again, I guess it's, it's just a quality I look for and the older I get, the more I look for it, of somebody who can laugh at themselves, who doesn't take themselves so seriously, and who doesn't preach. To me, the enemy in poetry is the voice that tells me how bad the Vietnam War is or whatever it is, as if I know, but none of you know. And there are a lot of climate poems like this now that I just literally can't bear because they're in that mode. Um, but um, I think Frank Wilkerson is, um, will go down in history as, as a major figure. He's writing a novel now because he's really a wonderful writer of being able to see things from more than one point of view and therefore seeing how complicated the race issue is, how incredibly complicated. And so I think that's quite brilliant. Thank you, Marjorie. Charlie, make your recommendation. Then I'm going to ask a little off script for you. This is a hard thing to do. Pick up the copy of your book, look to the preface or introduction, and maybe read a few sentences that will give us a flavor of it. Is that possible? <laughs> that may be hard. I can talk about it a little bit, but I don't I'll think do it. it. Uh, I've read it. It's the same voice. Bob, Bob can do it, yeah. <laughs> while, Bob, while Bob is looking for those few sentences that will give okay. our listeners a sense of the book, go ahead and make your recommendation. Well, let me, uh, two, two recommendations, really. One is the poet Robin Schiff. Um, and she's got three books. The first one is Worth, and the third one, which is really spectacular, has Worth in the title. I don't remember the, the, the rest of it. But what interests me about her is that she does a kind of free associational po poems that keep coming back to various motifs. So sh she has a kind of freedom, but a kind of structure at the same time, but it's not... Uh, not a fixed structure. I mean, it's, it, it's one of the ways of dealing with multiplicity and flux that I find uh, quite uh, exciting, and she's very inventive. Um, and the other book is uh, just my stuff, but uh, Heidegger wrote in 1951 a uh, kind of commentary on Hegel's philosophy of experience. And what's great about it is Heidegger and Hegel are like the last people to imagine in the same conjunction. Just Heidegger hated history. Hegel sort of shaped or tried to find a shape to history. But what Heidegger does is try to understand why Hegel's notion of experience is distinctive. And it's because you're aware of the conditions by which you're experiencing. And I, and I think that that is really relevant to what art does, uh, as well as what a possible uh, philosophy could do. But, but that is, I think most great, I think O'Hara is quite aware uh, uh, kind of this, is you don't just have an experience, but you have a, a sense of the significance of what you're experiencing at the, at the same time. And part of the, the, the activity of the poet is to relate that secondary level, your mental level in a way. Um, and so I think it was very exciting in lots of women. That directions. is the first time that Heidegger has been recommended in Gathering Paradise. 
Well, I bumper. never thought <laughs> I would be recommending plus. Heidegger, actually. <laughs> You're not uh, recommending him, but <laughs> we haven't heard Heidegger in Gathering Paradise. We now have. Um, Bob, did you find a couple of sentences that will convey I'm this? I'm going to read one sentence. Okay, cool. It's the first sentence of the last paragraph. This kind of exemplarity, he's been talking about Wharton. I should say that this book has three chapters. The second chapter is on prose fiction. And it's unusual for me, to, I've read Charlie for a long time, but not on prose fiction and not really on narrative. Uh, and on, he's generally writing much more abstractly uh, than narrative. And uh, so, any surprise, the second chapter is really good and really elegantly written and a pleasure to read. And Bob said it's different from the rest of my work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're a hard guy to read, yeah? It's, okay. Yeah. He, he's just um, hard. And uh, so here's the sentence. This kind of exemplarity, uh, based in the intensity of particular experiences, becomes for me a powerful picture of how art can modify a person's ethical commitments, not so much by, modify, not so much by modeling specific behaviors, but by displaying values we come to care about. And that notion at the end of coming to you, the art makes itself known through intensity and intensity of particularity and maybe intensity of things that are unfamiliar and you didn't know you cared about them until you, uh, until you read the poem or read the story. And that's, uh, I think that it's a nice, nice sentence and gives you a sense Fantastic. of his, uh, his desire not, not just to draw out matters of judgment from mm. examples, uh, but to draw out from intense experiences represented in art, and maybe not in anybody's life. Uh, Thank you, Bob. How, how wonderful to have yeah. such a thoughtful reader. I just want to say, I could not have schemed this elegant <laughs> and moving uh, I'm sense of my own worth. Well. You see? And I'm totally <laughs> blown great. away by this whole thing. Don't and believe I, it. There you go. He asked you me know. to do this. Every time we have a rookie at Pump Up, we treat them this nicely. Say the title, say the title <laughs> of the oh, book. Oh, the title again. of the book. Literature, yes. Education, and Society, Bridging the Gap. Uh, published by Rutledge and a short book, three chapters, as I said. Thank you. Very it's been, direct. It's now been recommended. Um, my uh, my uh, Gathering Paradise is a recommendation of a section of Barbara Guest's The Confetti Trees, which is possibly prose, possibly prose poems. Um, and the, the one section I'm interested in and I want to recommend is called The Minus Ones. And it was written as Barbara Guest was reflecting upon her girlhood in Los Angeles, surrounded by the emigres of World War II, people in art and film, uh, the brothers Mann, Mahler, Schoenberg, you know, the camera people. And she absorbed all of this sense of the refugees and their reasons for coming to Los Angeles as a child. And she wrote a piece, The Minus Ones, which is about a young girl trying to start to write. And she writes stories that no one will want to publish because they have absorbed the plotlessness and the avant-garde-ism of the people including the film people that she was surrounded by. Now read the last part of this section. She, the girl who's the Barbara Guest type who's trying to begin to write and submit stories, all of which are rejected. Um, she neglected to include the rituals, the reason why they were rejected. She neglected to include the rituals of contemporary life the scenario, and the scenario department, capital S, capital D, it's almost like Kafka, the scenario department complained when she wrote of wood burning, she said the devils inside the fire were excited. The fire scene of the thing she's writing destroyed any chance she had for her new stories to be accepted. They told her they liked real fires and not those of the imagination. Imagination was harmful and always messed up the set. And it's just a lovely reminiscence based really without Knowing this, you wouldn't know that the emigre experience of World War II with a girl growing up in Los Angeles was part of it. When you read it together, you realize her experimental, her experiment in a surrealist story writing 
has that as its basis, just for well, me, thank you. a remarkable thing. Well, that's all the no rain in California. And I say that because <laughs> I've been here all week, and there hasn't been any rain. And I realize that you guys there's no got snow. A, there's no snow in California. No hail. no hail. That's all the no rain in California we have time for on Poem Talk today. Poem Talk at the Writer's House is a collaboration of the Kelly Writer's House and Penn Sound and Jacket 2 at the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks so much to my guests, so much. This has been so great. Bob Von Hallberg, Charlie Altieri, and Marjorie Perloff. And thanks once again to Marjorie for hosting us today. And to Poem Talk's director and videographer, Zach Cardner, who's right there. I'm snapping away from my, uh, from my mic. So. And Chris Martin for handling the audio. Uh, and to Poem Talk's editor, the same amazing Zach Cardner, who's got quite a job ahead of him. <laughs> uh, next time, next time on Poem Talk, we'll be back at the Writer's House in Philadelphia talking with Erica Kaufman, Simone White, and Joan Ritalik about a poem by Tina Dara called Wire Boxes. It's a great poem. This is Al Filries, and I hope you'll join us for that or another episode of Poem Talk.